during my 45 years of ministry in East Africa, in the United States, in Europe and other places, I have discovered that uh, most of our people, most of God's people, are insecure about their salvation. You ask them the question, if you die today, will you make it to heaven? And they say, I'm not sure, I hope so. I have asked myself, what's the problem? And I've come to the conclusion that there are two main reasons why our people are insecure about their salvation. The first one is that they have not come to grips with what the Bible has to say about a sin problem. That is why in our last study, we dealt with the universal sin problem, the Bible definition of sin, because it paints a very dark, dismal picture of mankind. The purpose of that is to destroy all confidence in self. We need to realize our salvation is based entirely, 100%, on the righteousness of Christ. The second main reason why people are insecure about their salvation is that they have failed to see the distinction between the gospel itself and its application. And so I would like in the second study of this series to turn to the two dimensions of salvation. The purpose of this study is to show the distinction between the objective facts and the subjective experience of salvation, of the gospel. Now these two terms, objective and subjective, are theological terms. And you may say, what, what do they mean? Well, by the end of this study, I hope you will clearly understand this distinction between these two. Now, here is the Christian problem. One of the main reasons why so many Christians have no assurance of salvation is because they have failed to see the distinction between the gospel and its experience. To them, it is the same. That is, Christian living is the gospel. Not true, folks. The gospel and Christian living are related, but they are not the same thing. This is the major problem that has robbed most believers of the joy and the peace of salvation. As a result, they have become poor witnesses of the incredible good news of the gospel. So what we're going to study now is the two dimensions of the salvation to remove this problem. The Bible speaks of two dimensions of salvation that are related yet distinct. On the one hand, it speaks of salvation as an entirely or accomplished, already accomplished, entirely accomplished fact in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to take you through a series of texts that bring this out. There are many texts, but this one will help us. Let's turn to a very famous passage, John 3. Most of you know verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth should not perish. But look at verse 17. John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, even though that's what we deserve but that the world through him might be saved. That is why Jesus came to this world 2,000 years ago, to be the savior of mankind. Then going to chapter 17 of the same book, John 17 and verse 4, notice what Jesus says to his father as he approaches the end of his earthly mission. John 17 verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth because the devil had perverted Mist represented the Father. So now Christ is saying to the Father, I have clearly represented you. And number two, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. What work did the Father give him to do? We saw in chapter 3, verse 17, to save the world. And then on the cross, chapter 19 of John, as Jesus, before he bowed his head and died, he cried out in John 19 and verse 30. It is finished. In other words, salvation, full and complete, was finished on the cross. You can add nothing towards it. You cannot improve on it. And that is the objective facts of the gospel. So when you hear the word objective, it's referring to the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Period. These are the objective facts of the good news of the gospel. 
You remember when Jesus was born in this world 2,000 years ago? How was he introduced to those frightened shepherds at Bethlehem on Christmas night? Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. That's what the objective facts of the gospel is all about. But on the other hand, Scripture speaks of salvation as a subjective experience by those who have accepted Christ by faith as their personal savior. Now, if you look at John 3.16, both objective and subjective are there. The first part is objective. God so loved the world, that is the entire human race, that he gave his son to the entire human race. The second part says, but whosoever believeth, that is the subjective, whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I would like to read another statement regarding this subjective experience. From John chapter 5. This is the words of Jesus Christ himself. John chapter 5 and I'm reading verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, that is, I guarantee you, Jesus says, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me. Now remember, the Father sent him to save us. He who believes my word and, in, and believes in him who sent me has Please notice, has everlasting life. Not will have. He already has, because that is in Christ. And shall not come into judgment. The Greek word is condemnation. But has passed from death into life. Have you got it? Based on the objective fact, the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you have passed from death to life. Now, to avoid confusion between the objective facts of salvation, that is his birth, life, death, and resurrection, and its subjective experience, what the Holy Spirit produces in us, one must realize the distinction between the two dimensions of salvation. And that is what we're going to do. Otherwise, the gospel becomes good advice rather than good news. But the word gospel, the Greek word evangelio, does not mean good advice. It means good news. And when, it became, when you make it good advice, it robs believers of the peace and joy of salvation, which is a major problem. The devil has had tremendous success in doing this. We need to get rid of that. Okay, now, let's look at the distinction between the objective gospel, that is the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the subjective experience that is applied to believers who accept Christ. There are major distinctions. The first is the gospel is universal. What do I mean by that? Well, it includes the entire human race. None are excluded. And there are many, many universal texts in the New Testament. I'm going to read only two of them. The first one in his first Timothy. See what Paul wrote to this young intern. First Timothy chapter 2. And verse 5, 6, and 7. First Timothy, chapter 2. Listen to this. For there is one God and one mediator, that is a go-between. One God, one mediator, between God, that is between a holy God and man, sinful man. And that mediator is the man Christ Jesus. And as we sh shall see in our further studies, that Christ represents us before his Father. He is our high priest because he is our also Savior. Verse 6, who, that is Christ, gave himself a ransom, a payment for all. Have you got it? For how many? For all to be testified in due time. And then Paul adds in verse 7, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. Why does he say that? Because you see, folks, the gospel sounds too good to be true. So he has to emphasize the fact that what he's presenting is true. And that has to be accepted. Now we go to a little book called Titus. It's a little book just before Hebrews. Uh, in fact, it's before Philemon. And this little book, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, makes this statement. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, have you got it? Past 10, has appeared to all men, and the Hebrew, Greek is the all mankind. 
So this is the objective facts of salvation. It is universal. None are excluded. Does that mean everybody will go to heaven? The answer is no. Its experience is only applies to believers. Why? Because God has created us with a free will, number one. And number two, he does not force this good news on anybody. The gospel is God's supreme gift to all mankind. And like any gift, it has to be accepted. It has to be received. So the gospel is good, God's supreme gift to mankind, which has to be accepted. John 3.16 is very clear. Whosoever believeth shall not perish. But I would like to read two more statements in John 3. Because people think that you are lost because you are a sinner. Well, I have news for you. As we covered in our last study, the first study of this series, that we are sinners by nature. And God is not blaming you for being a sinner, for being born one. So in verse 18 of John 3, Jesus said, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Now we are already born condemned thanks to Adam. But now, because of the gospel, you are no longer condemned once you hear this good news because of Adam. But because, and I'm quoting Jesus, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is Jesus making that statement. And then in verse 36 of the same chapter, you have John the Baptist making this statement to the Jews. He who believes in the Son has, I like the emphasis, has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. You remember in our last study, the only sin that God cannot forgive is the sin of unbelief. And unbelief is a verb. It's a deliberate action of the will. It is a sin against grace. Not against the law. It's a sin against grace. Deliberate, persistent, ultimate rejection of Jesus Christ. Then in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, you have the great commission. God said, Jesus said to the disciples, go into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature, to every human being. That's in verse 15. And then in verse 16, Jesus added, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe, he who rejects this good news, will be condemned. That is why in Romans 5 verse 17, Paul wrote, only those who receive this gift of salvation, this objective gospel, will reign with Christ. Now number two, the gospel is a finished work. And I want to emphasize that the word finished. It's a finished work to which we can add absolutely nothing. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Jews, because chapter 9, 10, and 11 of Romans is addressing the Jews of his day. In chapter 10 and verse 3 and 4, for they, that is the Jewish nation, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and that's Paul's definition of the gospel, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, that is salvation by human effort, keeping the law and the rules, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Here you have two different methods of salvation. Salvation by human effort is referred to in the Bible as the old covenant. Salvation by grace alone is the new covenant. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, being ignorant of God's salvation by grace alone. These Jews were seeking to establish their own righteousness. And therefore they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now what is the righteousness of God? Well, look at verse 4. For Christ is the end, and that Greek word telos means completion, fulfillment. So Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You know, folks, every requirement of the law, its positive demands, obey and live, and its justice, disobey and die, both were met in the holy history of Christ. By his life and death, Jesus fully satisfied the demands of the law on behalf of the human race. 
That is why in Colossians 2.10, Paul said, we who accept this gift are complete in him. Now, what about the experience? Is the experience of salvation a finished work? And the answer is no. It's an ongoing process. Believers are growing in Christ. We begin as a babe in Christ and we begin to grow as we learn to walk in the Spirit. But our salvation not, will not be fully realized until the second coming of Christ. That is why Paul says in Romans 8, 24, 25, in fact from 22 onwards, he says, we are groaning, we are waiting for the redemption of the body. We have been redeemed, but our body has not redeemed. And in Philippians 3, Paul says in verse 20, our citizenship as Christians is in heaven, where we look forward to the coming of Christ so that he will change our lowly or our vile bodies and make unto his glorious body. So you see, the objective gospel is a finished work. You can't add, improve on it. But when it comes to the experience of salvation, it is an ongoing process. Some are babies in Christ. Some have become teenagers spiritually. A few have reached adulthood. And a very few have reached maturity. But because of the finished work of the gospel, we stand perfect in Christ. We stand complete. But our nature does not change one iota when you accept Christ. It is as sinful as it was before conversion. That is why Christian living is a struggle between flesh and spirit. And that's what Paul brings out in Galatians chapter 5. Now number three, the gospel is unconditional good news. What does that mean? People misunderstand that term. They think that we go to heaven unconditionally. No, I didn't say that. What do I mean when the gospel is unconditional good news? We are saved by grace alone. In other words, unmerited favor. We have done nothing to deserve salvation. In fact, what we have done is the very opposite. So we are saved by grace alone, apart from law keeping, apart from any good works. Now, is the Bible against these things? No, no, no. We are talking about keeping the law or good works in terms of contributing towards our salvation. That is not true. Yes, Christian living keeps the law as a standard of living. It does good works. But please make sure that the gospel is entirely the work of God. So here are some texts. Look at Romans chapter 3. Very clear statement. And remember, Paul is inspired. God is speaking through him. Chapter 3 of Romans and verse 28. He's discussed this gospel from verse 21. And verse 28 is the conclusion of chapter 3 of Romans. Therefore, we conclude. This is the conclusion of the objective facts of the gospel. Therefore, we conclude that a man or a person is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Is Paul against the law? No. When we come to chapter, you know, chapter 13 of, uh, of Romans, we will discover that Paul upholds the law as a standard of Christian living. But here he's dealing with how are we saved. And the answer is by grace alone. We are justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Then going to chapter 4 of the same book in verse 5, Paul makes this statement. But to him who does not work, have you got it? Who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. And that word ungodly in the original means wicked. His faith is accounted for righteousness. This is tremendous good news. And then in chapter 5, oh, I like chapter 5. Paul says four things that you need to be clear on. Two of them are found in verse 6. Chapter 5 of Romans verse 6 says, For when we were still helpless, Oh, without strength. In due time, appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. So we were helpless, we were wicked, that's what the word means, ungodly, and Christ died for us. Then in verse 7, he describes human love. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. That's human love, limited, conditional. But now look at verse 8. Begins with but, means in complete contrast to verse 7. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, have you got it? We were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. And then Paul goes one step further in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, that is God's enemies, because most manuscripts mix that statement. For if when we were God's enemies, we were past and reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved. So folks, the gospel is incredible good news. There's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing you can improve on it. You can simply accept it with grateful hearts. But does that mean, I bring that question up again, does that mean all men will go to heaven? And the answer is no. I, re I want to remind you, salvation, the gospel is a gift. Its experience is conditional in all three phases. What do I mean three phases? Well, it, when it comes to the experience of salvation, there are three phases. The first, of course, is justification by faith. And Paul says in Romans 5 verse 1, being justified by faith, the moment you accept Christ, we have present continuous tense, we have peace with God. We may not have peace with the government. We may not have peace with our neighbors. That is all horizontal kind of peace. And that's up and down. But vertically, between you and God, you have peace with God through justification by faith. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you have passed from death to life, from condemnation to justification. Now, number two requirement, sanctification. I wish we were automatic machines. You know, when we were missionaries in Africa, we had to wash the dishes with our hands. But, you know, because labor was so cheap, we would employ somebody to do it. Gave them some job because unemployment is very high in Africa. So we gave somebody a job and they did the washing. They did the sweeping of the house and so on. So when we came to the United States, you could not employ somebody to do that. That's too expensive. So the big question was, who's going to wash the dishes in the house? There are four of us. And we discovered that in America, they have a wonderful machine called a dishwasher. You dump all that stuff in that machine, turn the knob, press a button, and it does all the work for you. You know, I wish sanctification was like that, but I'm, I'm afraid it isn't. We have to learn to walk in the Spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And he also says in Romans 13 verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is abide in him and he in you, and you will be able to conquer the flesh. But all our lives, from the time we were born, we were walking in the Spirit, in the flesh. And now we have to learn to walk in the Spirit. So it's an ongoing process. And in that process, we will fall many times. But thank God, in Jesus Christ, we stand complete. But there is a third requirement, and that's glorification. Glorification is the ultimate experience of salvation when Christ will come to take us to heaven. For that ultimate salvation to be a reality, our faith must endure to the end. You know, when Jesus was about to leave this earth, he spoke to his disciples in Matthew 10, beginning with verse 17. And he said to them, when I leave you, you will be in much trouble. You will be persecuted. You will be taken to court. You will be flogged. All kinds of problems you will face. Don't give up your faith. And then he adds in verse 22, he who endures to the end, he whose faith remains solid to the end, will be saved. You have the same thing in Hebrews chapter 10, which I would like to read for you. Now, Hebrews was written to the Jewish believers of the New Testament time. They were being persecuted both from their fellow Jews for turning their backs on Judaism, and they were persecuted by the Romans, the Gentiles. And the writer of Hebrews is concerned that their faith do not fail. In fact, he begins in chapter 10, verse 35 onwards. Let me just read verse 35 and then we'll go down to 38 and 39. Hebrews 10, verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, your confidence in whom? Not in yourself, but in Christ, which has great reward, that is, eternal life and heaven and new earth. So, do not cast away your confidence in Christ, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, which is to believe in Jesus Christ, John brings that out in 1 John chapter 3, you may receive the promise. Now let's go down to verse 38. Now the just shall live 
by faith. Or a better translation is, he that is just by faith shall live. But, there's a but. If anyone draws back, if anyone turns his back on Christ by unbelief, my soul has no pleasure in him. You know, my dear people, nowhere in scripture does it ever teach that once you're saved, you can never be lost. Once saved, always saved is a heresy. But as long as you're a believer, as long as you, your faith in Christ is not given up, you can be sure your salvation is guaranteed. That is why I like verse 39. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. Have you got it? We are not of those who draw back to perdition. But of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So my dear people, the most valuable thing you possess in this world is not your stocks, is not your houses, is not your bank account, because all that will go as we approach the end. Your most valuable thing you possess is your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't you ever allow anything to deprive you of that faith. The devil will do his best. He'll make life difficult for you. But remember, as long as you're a believer, Christ is on your side. He will defend you and vindicate you in the judgment. Now let's go to number four, distinction. The gospel is meritorious. Now that's a big theological term. What does it mean? It comes from the word merit. Well, this is what it means. This is what, it, this is what qualifies believers for heaven now and in the final judgment. We read John 5, 24. The moment you believe, you have passed from death to life. In Romans 8, verse 1, in the context of the struggle of us Christians that he explains in chapter 7, he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In spite of your struggles, there is no condemnation. Why? Because the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has, past dead, set us free from the law of sin and death. And that's in verse 2. Now in 1 John, there is something you need to know. Now we will study in a later study, the judgment. Because the judgment, especially the investigative judgment, has produced much fear in the lives of God's people. And one reason for that is they have not understood the unconditional, self-emptying love of God. That is why we, in this series, we are going to spend two studies on the love of God. Now, in view of this, let's look at what First John chapter 4 says. I'll first read verse 9 and 10. It's not on the screen, but I'll read verse 9 and 10, and then we'll come down to verse 16 to 18. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested, past tense, towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. That's the objective facts of the gospel, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God. Please notice, we are not saved because we love God, but that He loved us. He took the initiative and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Now that word propitiation is confusing to some people. The Greek word is hilasterion. It is the same word that was used for the covering, the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place of the sanctuary message God gave the Jews. In the ark itself were the Ten Commandments, the tables of Ten Commandments, which condemns us. The mercy seat, the covering, covered that condemnation. And that is the word propitiation or expiation, as some Bibles put it. Now, with this in mind, let's go down to verse 16, 17, and 18. And we have known and that is what we need to know. That's why I'm going to spend two studies on the love of God in this series. Now, we have known. What do we know? And believe. So please, two things. We have to know and believe. Because the love of God is too good to be true. It sounds completely contradicting human love. And we'll see that in a future studies. And we have known and believe. The love that God has for us. And that word is agape. Unconditional self-emptying love of God. We believe the love of God for us. God is love. Please notice, John does not say one of God's attributes is love. God is love, period. Everything about God's behavior, his judgments, his dealings with the human race, 
his dealing with the, with the universe is always founded on his love. Sometimes it doesn't seem so, especially when you read the Old Testament. But the fact is God is love. And he who abides in love, that is the moment you abide in God's love, abides in God and God in him. Now look at verse 17. Love has been perfected among us. That is, our understanding of love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness, I like that, we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How many of you have boldness in the day of judgment? Why should we have boldness? Here is the reason. Because as he is, the he is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, when you accept Christ, God no longer looks at you as you are in yourself, a sinner. He looks at you as you are in his son. Holy and blameless. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, we read these words. God chose us in Christ to be holy and without blame. That is how God looks at you the moment you accept Christ. Verse 18, there is no fear. I'm not reading 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. So if you've really understood the love of God, the fear of the judgment goes. But perfect love, that is the perfect love of God which we know and believe, casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. Are you afraid of the judgment? Are you afraid of the punishment the judgment brings to sinners? No, because the love of God has set you free. But he who fears, if you're still afraid about the judgment, has not been made perfect in love. That is why we need to spend two studies on this wonderful truth. Now, what is the subjective experience all about? You know, if I'm already saved, if I'm already stand perfect in Christ, if I'm already justified in Him and have peace, does that mean that I can live as I please? And folks, the Bible does not teach cheap grace. Cheap grace is living as you please because you are saved in Christ. There are some Christians who fall for this. Let me give an example. I was, in, I was working as a missionary in Uganda, and since my parents come from India, one of these Ugandans came up to me. He thought he was a Hindu. I was a Hindu, and he said to me, he asked me a question, are you saved? And I said, saved from what? And he said, are you saved from sin? And I said, can you be more specific? Are you talking of the guilt and punishment of sin? Or are you talking of the power and slavery to sin? Or are you talking of the nature and presence of sin? Which one? And he looked at me and he said, you sound like a pastor. And I said, yes, I am a pastor. You see, when the Bible talks of salvation as an experience, it uses all three verb tenses. The moment you accept Christ and you have passed from death to life, you can say, I am saved only from the guilt and punishment of sin. But now, in the process of sanctification, you have to say, I'm being saved daily as I learn to walk in the Spirit. That is the present continuous tense. But that doesn't change your nature. And one day, when Christ comes, and you are glorified, then you can say, I am fully saved. But until then, you can say, I will be saved. So you are saved already from the guilt and punishment of sin. You are being saved daily from the power and slavery to sin. And you will be saved when Christ comes from the nature and presence of sin. So I said to this young man, if you are saved, because that's what he claimed to be, how come I smell pombe, which is the Swahili word for this banana beer that smells to the high heaven? And he said, Pastor, we are saved by grace, not by what we do. Now, technically, he was correct, but he was misusing the truth. So I said, can you please explain to me, what do you mean, saved by grace? And he said to me, Christ did it all instead of me. I said, really? Can you please explain that to me? You mean to say he lived a perfect life instead of you? And he said, yes, sir. And then what about his death? Did he die on the cross instead of you? And he said to me, you've got it now. And I said, no, no, no. I'm going to take your theology to its ultimate conclusion. And he said, what's that? I said, he actually went to heaven instead of you. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to heaven. 
I said, brother, if you are going to heaven, then you have to understand that his life and his death, you were involved, you were implicated, because before God could save you, God put the human race into Christ. God united the divinity of Christ with our corporate humanity. And Jesus became the God-man. This qualified him to be our Savior. So when he lived a perfect life, you were in him. When he died on the cross, you died in him. If you don't believe me, read your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. When one died, all died. Therefore, I want you to look at your text. He had a New Testament pocket edition in his pocket. I made him pull it out. And I made him read. I could give him many texts. But I gave him a statement that Paul made to Timothy, a young man like him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Listen to what Paul wrote here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. This is a faithful saying, a true saying, a trustworthy saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Do you notice? We have to die with Christ first before we can live with him. You see, in this world, you are born with a life. A life that stands condemned to death because of Adam's sin. Plus yours. But in the gospel, it is reversed. You have to say goodbye to the life that you were born with because he died on the cross. In exchange, God will give you his life through the Holy Spirit, new birth. So my dear people, what is Christian living all about? It is demonstrative. What do I mean by that? Well, Christian living, this is what witnesses or gives evidence to others of our salvation to unbelievers. Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35, by this all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another in the same way that I have loved you. That is why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, he said, you've been taught in verse 43 to love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you, that you may reflect the love of your Father. That is demonstrative. You know, if Christians will love each other, they would give evidence to the world. There would have been no genocide in Rwanda, where Christians killed Christians, and so on. Now, Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship in Christ for good works. Not for our benefit, but for the others. And then in Titus 3.8, Paul makes that clear. That Paul says to Titus, it is a faithful thing. You must constantly remind the Christian that they must be always concerned about doing good works, not for their peace or their salvation, but for others, that others may see. Let me give you two statements. One by a very famous atheistic philosopher, but he was the son of a Lutheran pastor. His name was Nietzsche. This is what he said to Christians. If you expect me to believe in your Redeemer, you will have to look a lot more redeemed. And then this statement made by Mahatma Gandhi, that great Indian uh, uh, famous man, when he was working in South Africa as a lawyer, he made this statement to the Dutch Reformed Church, which was condoning apartheid, which is a contradiction of the gospel. He said, when you Christians live the life of your master, all India will bow down to Christianity. Do you know why Christianity has been given such a bad name in the Middle East, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world? Because they see the TV program, they read in the Newsweek the signs, all the terrible things that are taking place in Christian countries. See, we are not afraid to expose our problems. But to them, what we are doing is a contradiction to what we claim to be, a Christian country. So please remember that the experience of salvation is demonstrative. It does not contribute towards our salvation, but it demonstrates it reveals, it witnesses the power of the gospel in our lives. The gospel is not only saving us from death to life or from condemnation to justification. The gospel also saves us from a life of selfishness to a life of love, self-emptying love. And that is why 
The gospel is important. Now, let's look in closing the relationship between the two dimensions of salvation. The objective facts, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, which saves us, and the subjective experience that is experienced by those who accept Christ as their Savior. All true Christian experience, and this is something you need to know, it is a must. All true Christian experience is based on the objective facts of the gospel. Now remember, the objective facts is the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, period. You can't add to that. Let me read you this very important statement Paul made to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Listen to what Paul wrote here. It is something we must keep in mind. Chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, and we'll start with verse 11 and read right up to verse 13. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, foundations are very important. For example, when there was this great earthquake in New Mexico, in, Me in Mexico, in New Mexico, many of the buildings collapsed because their foundation was weak. A same, similar kind of earthquake, like New Mexico experience. If it took place in California, most of the buildings would stay upright. Why? Because California has very stringent laws on their foundation because it's prone to earthquakes. Christ is the foundation of every Christian experience. So Paul says in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 3, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid. It's already been laid, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ. It's a past history, which is Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 12, using building material as metaphors of Christian living, in, as metaphors of Christian beliefs. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, this is building materials of his day, each one's work, verse 13, will become clear, for the day will decay it. What day? The day of persecution, the day of judgment, so on. Because it will be revealed by fire, by persecution, and that fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. You know, when we are under persecution, your faith is tested. But if your faith is resting on the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, it will be able to stand. If, it is, if your faith is resting on your feelings, which goes up and down and is changeable, you will not be able to make it. So number one, we must be clear. Everything we experience, everything we believe as Christians must be based on the objective facts of our Lord Jesus Christ, his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Number two, if our knowledge of this gospel, facts, is incomplete, and that's the problem with many Christians, so will be our experience. Because our experience is related to our knowledge, understanding of the gospel. And number two, if, any, if our knowledge of the gospel, facts, is incorrect, and that's another problem with many Christians, so will be our experience. Many Christians confuse Christian living with the gospel. No, no, Christian living is not the gospel. It's the application of the gospel. It is the fruits of the gospel. The gospel is what Christ obtained for mankind 2,000 years ago. So my dear people, I close this study with the concern that we understand the objective facts of the gospel, the two dimensions of salvation, so that our faith is resting, not in what God does in us through the Holy Spirit, because nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that the Holy Spirit is a co-redeemer. We have only one Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And He has obtained for us salvation full and complete. And as long as our faith is resting in that finished work, our Christian willing, living will be correct. So it is my prayer that you will know this truth. The truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And be set free. Amen.